You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. guys super excited about this episode in fact it's one that we've been telling you was coming for a while we are going to get the opportunity to discuss hacking the fafsa now i get that's a little bit of a clickbait title but honestly what it comes down to is knowing the rules so many of us have kids that are either going to college in the very near future or will be on that path soon and it is incredibly important to know how our system is actually set up and depending on your unique path how those numbers can change and what you can do as you approach that time where your child is actually going to be college to make sure that you're in the most advantageous situation possible. So to, to help us unpack this, because this is incredibly technical and valuable information, we have asked Brian Eufinger, uh, who we actually featured in episode 114 of our podcast from Edison Prep. He has a SAT tutoring program that he offers in the local Atlanta area, and also Sun Wu, who has been working with us since basically the inception of this podcast. He's one of the moderators on our Facebook group. He's an incredibly intelligent source of knowledge when it comes to when it comes to investing, talking about how to properly use the Roth and how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> and also for us, how the FAFSA is actually structured and how your income level, how your real estate properties, how your assets get factored into that equation. And really, this is a very, very exciting episode. And help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing great. And yeah, to your point, it's about knowing the rules. There are very specific rules in life in all aspects. And the more information you have and the more time you have to plan, the better result you're going to have. College and college aid is a very high dollar figure issue that many of us are going to be dealing with for either ourselves or our kids. And to have two experts like Brian and Sun Woo on the podcast to help us really walk through the rules and how to potentially maximize it if your situation will work with them. This is what it's all about. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Excited to be here, guys. Happy to be back. So, guys, I feel like the place to start when you're dealing with anything technical is the beginning. And specifically, the beginning for me is like definitions of terms. Instead of diving into the weeds and assuming that everybody knows all this stuff, let's go back and talk about a few things like FAFSA, EFC, cost of attendance. Let's go through what these terms actually mean for someone that's in the process. Sure. Happy to. As far as expected family contribution goes, some parents would take issue with that definition because uh, that's not what they're expecting to pay. But it's a, a piece of nomenclature that when you fill out the various financial aid forms, it spits out an EFC. While college is getting more expensive and there's certainly a lot of uh, negativity around the increasing college costs, if we're giving people their credit, a lot of great websites, both helpful nonprofit websites as well as some governmental ones, the last five years have seen a stratospheric increase in them trying to help parents have a more realistic understanding even while their kid's an eighth grader or a ninth grader where they can do FAFSA forecaster, which we'll get to later in the show and what's your EFC. A lot of individual schools make it easy to find on their sites too. So while the whole process is stressful and college is definitely, you know, unfortunately getting more expensive, a lot of this stuff for parents who avail themselves of knowledge like this podcast and other resources online, it doesn't have to be as scary of a mess of alphabet soup as it seems at first glance. So as far as the expected family contribution, which is some places just abbreviated the EFC and hope that parents know what that means, it is after you insert all of your family's different financial statistics, it spits out a number that that is the expected amount that you, the parents, would be contributing to via sources, whether it's assets in your parents' names or the child's name or both, what the parents and child would combine contribute on an annual basis to that school. Many parents will find that that number is higher than anticipated and, and higher than they possibly had. 
as far as the cost of attendance, the COA, uh, a lot of parents, just like if you go to a resort, you look, you think the price is the price and you're looking at tuition. But once you start adding in tuition, technology fees, room and board and parking pass and books and this and that, student activities fees, the COA and, and colleges have also been better at getting transparent on this at laying out all the different fees. So the co- the total cost of attendance is basically all of those things I just listed. So to help bridge this gap here, COA is like the MSRP on a car. It's like the total cost of everything altogether. EFC is a calculation that the government makes based on your filling out the FAFSA. And then based on that, it tells you, and I guess we should define what FAFSA is, but application, right? Once you fill out this application for aid, the government then tells you what your expected contribution to that will be. And then the difference is that bridged by student loans that the government will either subsidize or unsubsidize. Correct. So basically, to the extent that your family doesn't have the money to meet the EFC at the school you've chosen to attend, there are unsubsidized Stafford loans where the interest accrues on your dime while you're in college. There are slightly better ones that are subsidized Stafford loans that where you're not on the hook for the interest. Uh, the government takes that heat uh, while you're in school and then it starts accruing. And then there's other vehicles like parent plus loans that are on the parent, not the student, um, just traditional private loans that could be taken out of a bank like any other bank. And then there's also other funding sources that you might be able to tap, such as grandparents or kids' savings or other things that we'll get into later in this episode. All right, Brian, let's talk this through in just a hypothetical example. Let's say you fill out these student aid applications like the FAFSA and you get this EFC back at like $10,000 a year but your student is going to a university that costs 50,000, their cost of attendance, just again, hypothetically, that 40,000, the the difference, that's not like, okay, that's all free. That's wiped off. It's loans and all those other things you just mentioned. Is there any template of what someone could expect? Again, in this hypothetical of 50 K cost of attendance, 10 K EFC, like how they would see that 40,000 split up. Sure. There is a list of schools that we can give you for the show notes, and it may even be in the show notes for episode 114 as well. There's a small list of schools that promise to meet full need, full need being defined as the number on your EFC. The larger a school's endowment on a per student basis, the more realistic that is. So there's no malice at some of the other schools that are smaller and have smaller endowments. It's just a matter of keeping the lights on. And there are schools that a term that you won't hear used as often by consumers, but in the industry here all the time is, is a school tuition driven, which is a polite way of saying our endowment is not the largest and really without most kids carrying most of their tuition costs, we would not be able to make it. So the more uh, heavily endowed a, a school is, the more likely they're able to be on that list of either meeting all or trying to meet all of a student's need. Now, there's a combination. There are schools that give grants, which are not paid back. There's a variety of loans that I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, There's also options on campus like a work-study job, uh, which is coordinated through the school as well as the federal government to provide an on-campus job for students that doesn't disrupt their studies but can help with the overall aid package. And then there's private loans and other vehicles. But in a perfect world, students would be able to have that aid met based on the gap between their need. Now, I want, I, one smart thing to do, I know uh, Sun Wu has a lot of knowledge about gapping and some of the stuff that is, it's a term called gapping that students and parents might actually start to hear since it's being covered more in the me, in the media. Yeah. So uh, gapping is a practice where even in that example of a school costs 50,000 and the expected family contribution comes out to 10,000. So in that scenario, the school quote unquote should provide $40,000 of aid. But gapping is a practice where they say, sorry, even though you should quote unquote only pay $10,000, we're only going to give you maybe 30,000 or 25,000 in aid. This practice varies by school. If you're looking at a school on the list that we'll have in the show notes. They don't practice gapping. So we want we want a school in theory, you know, if you're maximizing your aid, you want a school that does not practice gapping, right? That meets full need. Correct. So Sun Wu, as you're filling out the FAFSA, you know, what are the elements that carry the most weight on determining your EFC? It is divided into parental versus students. Student income is weighted the heaviest. The government expects the student to contribute 20% of their assets and 50% of their income. And that's not on a progressive scale, unlike the parental income or assets. So it's not on a progressive scale. So that means that if you have been 
and we'll, we can come back to the practicalities of this later, but that means if your child has a ton of money in their savings account or you have been saving money diligently for your child, either in like a Vanguard account or a savings account or something in, in their name, then that is actually going to be weighted heavily and it's likely going to raise the EFC for that child as they fill out the FAFSA. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. All right. Well, maybe not awesome, but what, what are the other elements of this application? So next is student income and student income is assessed at 50%. And when I keep saying assess, I mean it's added to the expected family contribution. Sunwoo, just to stop you, their income is only 50%, but their assets are essentially assessed at 20%. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, but you have to keep in mind that these figures get applied each year. So you have to fill out in general the FAFSA four times for four school years. So every single time they're going to ask you to contribute 50% of your income as a student and 20% of your assets. But looking at, let's say, freshman year, let's just say for argument's sake, you had 10 grand saved up in various accounts. So 20% of that would be assessed the first year and go into your EFC. And then when the second year's form rolls around, you only have $8,000 left. And then that EFC portion would be 20% of that, which would be 1600 right? Yeah. So that was all for the student's own assets and income. Then we get to the parental assets and income. And it's much more favorable because firstly, it's on a progressive scale. So much like how, you know, we have graduated tax brackets that range from 10 to 40%, the assessment for parental income and assets caps out at either 47% for income and only 5.64% for assets. All right, Sunwoo. So the first thing that jumps out to me is parental assets are assessed at 5.6%. It sounds like at the maximum, whereas student assets are assessed at 20%. So I have been setting up these accounts in my daughter's names and having them diligently put their savings into their Vanguard accounts and things like that. Is that the wrong plan? Should I be housing these assets myself and earmarking them is that a viable or legitimate strategy or, or talk me through this? If you expect that you will be eligible for aid, then having money in your kid's name is not optimal. Of course, if you don't expect to get any aid at all, then you just shouldn't worry about it. Right. And so that's kind of the heart of what we're doing. First, we're just defining terms and then we're defining the rules and then we're looking for different people in different stages. You know, what is the best way to optimize? Because there's kind of like there's several different plays here. One of those plays is just that, you know, you don't need to worry about this. You've got the money set aside. It's been there the whole time. You're just paying essentially MSRP for the face of college. You're not going to qualify for the aid anyway. So you might as well just optimize that strategy and do it the most tax efficient way as possible. The other half of that is you do expect to qualify for aid. You're kind of in the middle there and you're trying to figure out, well, I do have some assets. What's the best way to structure those? And then the other is just, you know, aid is the obvious play for that individual, you know, how to even optimize it at the extreme end as well. So I think that's kind of kind of set us up down the road, but we don't need to go there yet. So I think one interesting thing is like the school year is kind of different than the calendar year, right? And so uh, I'm curious, you know, as you guys tie back what school year you're applying to your tax year and to your calendar year, what assets are actually being tested, Brian? Many parents, as college has gotten more expensive and parents are, you know, a certain subset of savvy parents are always looking for ways to avoid cost, they've had to adjust the FAFSA. So without getting into too much of a rabbit hole of detail, if a parent of a current rising senior or kid who's going to be, who's already in college looks up the term prior, prior year for FAFSA, basically they made the look back for financial purposes one year earlier than they used to, which what that does is if parents were thinking of having fun games and some funny business, legal funny business, but you're moving assets around to try to optimize things. You have to get an earlier head start. So you can't just do it the day before your kid walks on campus and, and say, see, it was this way all along. So, you know, it's nothing untoward. It's just you have to start planning earlier, which is why getting this information in parents' hands so they can optimize their situation is important. Uh, And we'll get more into this, I'm sure in a few minutes, but there's also two, competing financial aid forms. There's the FAFSA and then there's the CSS profile. And there's different nuances based on which schools your kid's applying to and which form they use. Yeah. And if I can just jump in here. So for example, if your kid was going to college this fall, so in the 2019 to 2020 school year for FAFSA, it's going to ask you for information from your 2017 tax returns. Okay. So that's what they mean by prior prior year. It's two years behind. 
All right. One follow up on this. You know, I referenced earlier, you know, you kind of have three different case studies. So someone that is extremely high income that probably isn't going to qualify for any sort of financial aid, someone that if they optimize things will be able to qualify for some and then someone that it's an obvious choice, but they still probably should be optimizing a few things. So, you know, there's a spectrum there and it's an income spectrum. It's an asset spectrum. But like my question is. Is there anybody that just shouldn't even bother filling out the FAFSA? Is this something that everybody needs to do? Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think in the big picture of college, college is it, one is important academically. It's a big purchase for everyone, um, unless you ha- are lucky enough to get uh, most of a full ride or a full ride. But we tell all of our families that we work with for our tutoring business, go ahead and fill it out. Stylish pessimism definitely exists among high income parents. A lot of times, if they're dual income, you know, decent earning families. The one I'll always remember is because I just told him, I said, you're possibly flushing, you know, lighting money on fire, flushing money down the toilet if you don't fill it out. Uh, so they had multiples. Uh, she had she had twins and then the, the, she had other kids that were close together. So at least for the first year of college, yes, she might have been a surgeon here in Atlanta, but she had four kids in college at once at schools that were not cheap. And, and so I said, I have no clue what you make. I don't need to know, but I'd be shocked if your number came out saying, sorry, you're too rich for anything, despite having four kids in colleges that summed up to the sticker price on the four had to be probably almost a quarter million dollars a year. So you have, you have to be making a lot of money for that not to be something. And so she sent me a text back. She's like, you're right. She's like, it's not nothing. But she's like, it's, you know, it, we'll see if they give me anything. They might get me. They might say sorry. But she got a little bit from at least one or two of the schools that her her four kids went to. So she was happy she did it. Now, the more important reason to fill it out regardless is that's an extreme scenario. Most people don't have four kids in college at the same time. But there are some schools where why are they doing it this way? Uh, when they will, what they'll say is, oh, if you want to compete for our, air quotes, merit aid scholarships, you have to fill out the FAFSA. And you know there should be a Chinese wall between the financial aid department and admissions department. They always say that. And most schools don't make you do that, but a, a not insignificant number do make you fill out that form. And you know the analogy I always use is when a lawyer um, has a witness on the stand and they ask them a question, it's because they think it serves some probative value and they plan on using it for something. They're not just there to waste people's time. So for better or for worse, you still should fill it out. But the schools that make you do that, I, I always have to wonder. So there's no way to know for sure. Brian, before you mentioned the CSS profile, and I've certainly heard of the FAFSA many, many times before, but this is the first time that the CSS profile has crossed my plate. Talk us through what this is, what type of colleges use it. Is it in addition to or in place of the FAFSA? Um, So the best analogy that I use with our tutoring families here in Atlanta is if you want to think of the FAFSA like the 1040 EZ, uh, where the CSS profile will be like the 1040 long form, there's certainly a lot more nuance and more variables that go into the profile than the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is right there in the name. It's it's run by the federal government. Uh, The CSS profile is a tool that was created by College Board. It's housed on the College Board site. Broadly speaking, and there are exceptions, but broadly speaking, if your student's looking at public schools, they're more likely to use the FAFSA. And if your student's looking at private schools, and or small liberal arts colleges, they're more likely to use the CSS profile. As far as the depth that they go into, it's important if possible, and it's not always possible, if your student has a good sense of what schools they might be applying to, and especially which ones are the highest priority versus lowest priority, there are certain techniques that as you end up researching the different financial aid pieces, if you see your whole list almost is schools that use the CSS profile versus the the FAFSA, then you might take slightly different steps financially to paint yourself in a better light for your for the form that more of your schools are going to use. Because certain steps that might help you in one area could hurt you in other areas based on differences in how they handle divorced and blended families, based on differences in how they count home equity versus rental equity versus all kinds of different variables. It gets very challenging to have a universal answer, but most parents, if they spent half an hour, maybe less, could pretty instantly figure out for their entire kids list of say eight schools, which ones do FAFSA and which ones do profile. Is there any sort of like 80, 20 there, any sort of like theme that we could pick out? I get that it won't apply to every single person, but what does it mean that like, you know, you talked about divorce or blended families. Can you give us an example of what maybe a individual saw when they did this? So 
I'm, this is secondhand info, but the most recent example from one of our students who was on the CSS profile, there's differences in which parent is the custodial parent. And like, as far as do both parents income count, how is the possible step parents income counted? I wouldn't want to give a universal answer because one, it's always changing, but two, I gotcha. there's all these rules about, you know, are you 50.1% living in one area versus other areas? And, but that is, I would say one thing, just as a general note, if there is a blended family divorce type situation, there are important rules to look at even earlier in that, for example, there's residency requirements. We have one student who ended up doing the last two years of uh, high school with dad in Florida because she wanted to get residency requirement stuff there because, you know, go Gators. So <laughs> that, I mean, that's a separate sub thread, but the more you have an atypical situation, the less boring you are. So if you're a family that has one W2 income, the end, a lot of the analyses are a lot different than if you happen to have rental properties or a blended family divorce situation or other things. So the runway where you want to start doing research gets longer if you have a more complex situation. Cool. We'll put a link in the show notes for all the colleges that participate in this CSS profile as well. Yeah. And unlike the FAFSA, which has a very well-documented methodology of figuring out your actual expected family contribution, universities that use the CSS profile in general can decide on their own what formula they use based on the information from your CSS profile to determine your expected family contribution. So it's it's quite difficult to talk in general terms as to how you can structure your assets and income on the CSS profile to be favorable for getting more aid. Well, so it really is a college by college basis. The CSS profile is just providing a significant amount of information on your financial life to the colleges, and then they determine what they do with it. Yeah. Okay. And, and part of it, if you if you recall, so back on episode 114, we talked about how my personal college experience when I ended up applying to a variety of private universities, most of which use the CSS profile, how could they all take my numbers and produce such different results? Part of it was a difference in just how much merit aid they thought I deserved, but part of it could also be what Sun Wu said, which factors they weight and count and care about versus discard. So there's there's more, I shouldn't say surprises because there's nothing untoward. It's just their own custom brew formula. There's more variety of outcomes and results with CSS profile than the, the FAFSA, which is more standard. So my like just you know, gut feeling here is, is there a way, and, and you can tell me if I'm just missed the point here or not, but as I'm looking at colleges and I'm open to a wide array of colleges, but I'm almost like putting a filter in for which ones don't look at the CSS. Like, I mean, am I, did I miss the mark? Is there a point in time in which the CSS actually works to your benefit or does it just make your life more difficult and it makes the economics of this less transparent? I mean, I can't really see a scenario where the CSS profile works to your benefit because I mean, they can ask you for information that you don't need to fill out on the FAFSA. For example, they can ask you about the equity in your own home, which the FAFSA never asks about. I do also want to point out, uh, there's actually a fee to fill out the CSS profile and submit it, whereas the FAFSA is free. Like, literally in the name, it's a free application. It's baked um, into the name. That's just what <laughs> it is. <laughs> Imagine if they tried to charge for it. Yeah, well, you're going to have to change the name, clearly. It sounds to me like most of the colleges do not require that the CSS be filled out. That should not be too limiting. In fact, is there a way that you could then look for colleges that only require the FAFSA or rather do not require the CSS? Can you reverse filter that? You could. I, I wouldn't necessarily use that to inform a college list. I, I would probably, one, because there's always possibly scholarships and there's highly different price tags for schools. I would probably view it as the other way around. So once you look at your college list, you can see how that plays with FAFSA and CSS profile. And you know, there, there's obviously a wide range of listeners to the podcast that have you know, various financial structures. If someone is of very, very limited means, they're going to look in, like they're in good shape from a financial aid standpoint on both on both forms. To the extent that someone has more means and is trying to paint themselves in a favorable light to be you know, less affluent than they are, then there's there's less gamesmanship generally available with the profile. All right, guys. So we're really trying to get to actionable content. How can we help someone? We have hundreds of thousands of people listening to this podcast in the FI community. We know in general terms, they're going to have some significant assets or they're certainly on the path now. And, and maybe by the time their kids are at this juncture, they're going to have significant assets. They may have their 
normal W-2 income. They may have rental income. Heck, they might be early retired and have no income. But we have a, a general sense. Significant assets in all likelihood, certainly as compared to people outside of the FI community. And we can set it up hypothetically like somebody with W-2 income or somebody who is truly early retired and has no income. If someone came to you with the situation of, I have W-2 income, I have significant assets, is that person just SOL or is there a way to hack this? So for example, if you're a homeowner, it's actually more advantageous to make extra mortgage payments because your equity in your personal residence doesn't count against you for aid. So if, for example, you were debating whether to make extra mortgage payments or to invest in your taxable brokerage account, but you want to increase your aid, then that's one point in favor of making extra mortgage payments. Now, this is really interesting. So basically what you're saying is, you know, you have an individual high W-2 income. They also have a lot of assets in investable taxable accounts. And they're trying to decide between just plowing every single extra dollar they make into those investment accounts. But at the same time, they have a child within the next several years is be going to college. This might actually weight a little bit more heavily towards throwing the extra money towards their mortgage because that effectively is a way of shielding it from the FAFSA. Right. And, and let me jump in and say one thing. So there's one client of ours who shared something with me just to be a helpful dad, but he nerded out and went on a bunch of different websites. And they're a very cautious family who had like an ally bank account where their emergency fund, since they were self-employed, was literally like $110,000 earning uh, one or two percent a year. Um, that's okay. Caution's okay. But once he realized most of the schools he was applying to uh, were FAFSA schools where they don't count the personal home equity and they didn't have their house paid off. So what he did was he went and got a $110,000 HELOC and then just drained it straight into the mortgage. So and he was proud of himself. That's the kind of thing where just as a caveat, you know, there'll be someone who's listening to this episode when it's the current episode is episode 995 and Anna's one of the co-hosts. Yeah, that, that is important that all this is with the caveat of the rules change. So you want to always be looking for articles that, you know, if it's from 2012, you know, run away, you know, look for articles that are in the, the last year or two. So I guess my next question is, as a parent that's looking to optimize their finances so that it doesn't actually hurt their kid's application process, I think one of the things to understand is how income is treated and so, or how assets are treated. So in my mind, you have your retirement accounts, you have your W-2 wages, you have maybe your taxable accounts, maybe something else. How are these treated on a FAFSA? So in general, you're going to take all the income that you would report on your taxes and report that also on your FAFSA, but you're also actually going to add back any retirement account contributions that you made. So while, of course, I'm not saying that you shouldn't contribute to your retirement accounts, either way, it counts as income. All right, Sunwoo, so we want to understand this. I mean, that conceptually makes sense because that's your gross income, right? Just because you're shielding it in a 401k or 403b, et cetera, it's still income. So that conceptually makes sense to me. Are interest and dividends and I guess especially like capital gains, are those treated the exact same way and applied at the same rate as W-2 income? Yes. There's no distinction between the types of income. It's all treated the same regardless. So one of the things that I guess we're collectively trying to do with this is help parents and kids that are going to college just avoid the pitfall. So I think we've kind of covered a few of these already. So for instance, uh, these additional supplemental applications that some colleges are requiring and how that may or may not affect their financial aid package. But Brian, I'm curious, in your mind, is there maybe additional pitfalls that we haven't really covered that families should be considering in terms of order op of operations, how to look for colleges, anything else that comes to mind? So I think philosophically, what we see with a lot of the families we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, they create the college list based on, you know, most families have heard of, most people have heard of a college list having safety schools and targets and reaches. So safety being safe and targets being probabilities and reaches being unlikelies, but let's go for it. And mostly they look at it simply as a sort of bell curve. You have to have two at the bottom just in case and have mostly targets and then reach for the stars on a, a school or two. And that's all fine and well, but I think that's looking at it like a one axis situation. Whereas a two axis situation is probably more appropriate for a lot of people, especially if you're, as your income grows more complicated and just generally higher. And that is having it thinking of the two axes, one being the admissions rigor of a school and one being the affordability. Uh, the afford too many families want to try to just throw all these applications out there, hope that some of the financial aid pops and hope we're not wrong. 
And then it can lead them to some pretty heartbreaking decisions or awkward you know, moments with their kid when they get into two schools. One they don't want to go to, it's cheap, and one that's they are in love with, but it's not affordable when they could have had a more balanced sort of quadrant of, of schools. Um, like, for example, so I talked about in episode 114, Georgia has an amazing scholarship program called the Hope Scholarship. You know, Florida has the Bright Futures. There are a number of different scholarship programs that states have, plus in-state tuitions, just less expensive in general than out-of-state. Um, in all states. So to use that analogy, could a kid in the lower quadrant, easy to get into and financially affordable, have Georgia Southern because their admission standards are lower and their HOPE scholarship eligible? On the other hand, another quadrant to think of that, the affordable but very hard to get into. So Sun Wu is a grad student at Georgia Tech, you know, you know, one of the top four engineering schools on earth. Uh, it's very hard to get into, but if you are a Georgia resident and you get in, you know, awesome, because anybody who has the stats to get into Georgia Tech qualifies for the highest level, the Zell Miller 100% everything tuition uh, hope scholarship. So that would be a financial safety, but a admissions reach. And so if you think of the four quadrants, that's, those are two of the four quadrants, just as an example. Too many people have all their schools in one quadrant or only one or two quadrants, but a more balanced approach could lead to a more optimal process, especially given that the predictability of applications is, is going down. And I think that's one thing, you know, I, like I mentioned in episode 114, but it didn't go into detail. I was just lobbing Hail Marys. I told my dad, I, I need $1,000 for application fees. And he's like, you need what? And I said, no, no, look at these stats. I'm probably going to get into all but one or two schools I apply to. But I know from my friend Andrew and Jimmy and some other people a year or two older than me that the combination of merit and financial aid was all over the map. So, you know, it's in the big picture of things that that application cost of an extra school or two was, you know, not that big of a deal in the, in the big picture, especially since you don't know what's going to pop where. So like the worst 50 or 60 bucks that sometimes people save is applying to one fewer school if they need to have a broader financial aid possible map. So let's take a couple minutes and actually just talk about funding vehicles. So let's say the parent is actually wanting to set money aside for their child. We talked earlier about how the FAFSA, you know, looks at assets in the child's name. I'm curious, like as you look through your different options and let's say we're just kind of putting to the side, just taking out loans. So parent plus loans, let's set that, let's set that to the side. We're putting aside the subsidized versus unsubsidized loans. Let's look at 529 plans versus UTMA accounts. And let's start with 529 plans. Sunwoo, what is this and how would this factor into a strategy? So there's two types of 529 plans. The first type is the investment type. It's basically like a Roth IRA for education expenses at the federal level. So you put money in, you can invest it. And as long as you use it to fund education, there's no taxes on the growth. And Also, depending on the state in which you live, you might get a deduction on your state taxes for your contribution. I also want to mention briefly that there are some states that offer a prepaid 529. Essentially, is you're prepaying for usually a semester at a time of college to be used in the future. So you're you're locking in the rates today to be used at a later date. So if college inflates at the same rate as medicine, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. So (laughs) arguably... Arguably, these states would have taken into account their, you know, their projections on how much it'll cost in the future. But, you know, it, it's it's hard to predict. So what are your thoughts on this? Is this for everybody? Is there anybody that should kind of second guess or is that should everybody just plow as much money as they're able to afford after funding their own plan for retirement as possible? If you are going to set aside money for your kids, in general, the 529 is a pretty good option, especially if you get that state tax deduction. There's actually also some tricks you can play with the 529 itself, and it actually ties back into the FAFSA. One distinction is that for a 529, there's always a custodian and a beneficiary. So if you, the parent, opens the 529, then you're going to be the custodian and you're going to name your kid as a beneficiary. And as long as you are the custodian... It is treated as a parental asset, not as a student asset. So that means it's assessed at that 5.64% rate that we discussed earlier. But if, for example, there are grandparents in the picture that you trust, then what you can actually do is have the grandparents open a 529 and either they put in their own money or you might even give them your money for them to put in to that 529. And the reason this is advantageous is when you fill out the FAFSA, Because you are not the custodian, the grandparent is, that 529 balance never gets reported. So it's not assessed as an asset on the application. But what ends up happening is when you take money out of that grandparent's 529, 
that has to be reported as untaxed income on the FAFSA. But because the FAFSA uses the prior prior year that we talked about, where um, there was a two-year delay between the income being realized and then having it be reported on FAFSA, as long as you do this in junior year, second semester or later, that withdrawal never actually gets reported as income on FAFSA and it doesn't affect your aid. Okay, so having it in the grandparent's name and only taking the actual money out in junior year, that will have a 0% impact on the student, on the FAFSA, as I'm hearing it. So that makes perfect sense. So so I already have 529 set up. I guess I'm the custodian. My daughters are named on this. Is there any way at this point to put myself as the recipient and make it so that it's only, I guess, 5.64% or whatever it is, as if it's my asset as opposed to their assets? Like, can I do that at this point? Is that a strategy? Because you're the custodian on it, it's already going to be assessed that way at 5.64%. Okay. So moving it to your grandparents or having your grandparents run it would effectively only be a 5% savings? Yes. And also to clarify, it's not being tested at 50% of your child's EFC? No, as long as you are the custodian. Sunwoo, it's the custodian. It's not the beneficiary. So I don't need to be the custodian and the beneficiary. As long as it's I'm the custodian, it's at my 5.6%. Right. That's really useful info. Now, let's contrast that with UTMA accounts. Let's say someone is like right now strategizing what they want to do. And on the one end, they're saying, okay, 529, lock in like a Roth-like vehicle, maybe get a state tax deduction. But on the other end of that, they're saying, or I could just do a... UTMA and Brad, help me with that. Uniform transfer to minors. Act, yeah, that's maybe. Nice. <laughs> Stumble my way <laughs> through it. Less confident with each additional word. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sun Wu, help me. Like, what's the play here? Why would someone go with UTMA instead? So, in general, if you want to maximize aid, the UTMA is not the way to go uh, because once a child gains control of the account, which depending on the state is at 18 or 21, it gets counted as a student asset and then that gets assessed at 20%. Okay, so the only real reason that you would want to do a UTMA instead then is if you're worried that you're investing all this money for your child to go to school and then they don't go to school. I mean, that, that that's effectively the only real downside to the 529 as I'm hearing it. And please enlighten me if I miss something. No, you, you've got that right. Because if you withdraw money from the 529 and don't use it for education, then you pay a 10% penalty. Now, I will point out it's only a 10% penalty on the gains. It's not a 10% penalty on the entire withdrawal. Okay, that is actually really useful, Sonu. I did not realize that. I always assumed that it was based on the entirety of the balance that you're withdrawing, but it's just on the gain portion. Right. So to clarify, you put $100,000 in a 529 from the age of whatever, 6 to 18. It it appreciates to maybe $150,000. They don't end up going to school, so they end up getting penalized, but it's not on the full 150. It would be on that 50K in capital appreciation. That's what the 10% penalty would be apprised on. Right. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, there's some back and forth there and 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 I appreciate you taking the time to kind of do a little compare and contrast. I want to mention two more things back on the 529 since we've been talking about it. One is that not all 529s are the same and I'd love for you to comment on that. And then two, what your options are, you know, like is there anything creative you can do if you don't end up using it for your child's intended purpose? Can you transfer it to a sibling, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so the quality of 529 plans vary depending on the state. Some of them have House very Virginia. High fees. <laughs> um, from what I remember, Virginia is all right. But even if your state's 529 plan has significant fees, it might still be worth using it because one, if you get certainly if you get the tax deduction, then it's worth considering. And also, um, there's a link I can provide in the show notes for. The states that don't recapture the deduction if you roll it over to a different state. Suppose you have in your state, they offer a deduction for the 529, but it has high fees. Well, you can contribute money anyway and then roll it over to a different 529 plan with a different state, like say Utah or New York that offer good 529s and they won't take back that deduction on your state taxes. What would be the criteria to roll it over? Because you move to Utah or New York? You know, am I no, missing something sorry. there? Or you um, can have it in any 529 you want. Yeah, so you're eligible to open any state's 529 whatsoever. You're not restricted to just using your state's. Like blanket rule. So like I don't need yep. to just use a Virginia one. I could just go pick the best 529 in the country and use that vehicle. Correct. 
would I lose my state deduction? Because I know that you said that was one of the perks. Any Anything there? I just want to check because that sounds almost too good to be true. In general, if your state offers a deduction, you have to contribute to your state's 529 plan. But some states won't take back your deduction if you roll it over to a different state's 529. Sunwoo, can you do that year by year? I mean, put the contribution in, get the deduction for your state, and then roll it out? Yeah. Okay. I feel like so this is a really good question. I'm kind of excited about this answer. <laughs> awesome. All right, Brian. Hey, can we bring you back into this just because you mentioned a HELOC trick earlier as we're talking about funding vehicle. It seems like it fits. Explain to me again why a HELOC could be a useful funding vehicle as you're thinking about how to go about planning for your child's college education. Sure. There was a dad who was pretty proud of himself. He was meeting with his CPA who gave him this advice and, uh, Granted, it was 2016, so always check this before and see if at the time you're listening to this podcast, whatever year that is, to make sure it's still allowed. Because a, a lot of this financial aid stuff is like whack-a-mole, where when one technique gets too popular, stuff changes. But um, this family, from a caution standpoint, they were self-employed, uh, had a very large emergency fund, like $100, $110,000 or something. It was just sitting in an ally bank or an ING or whatever. And he instead got a HELOC for that exact same amount against their house that they had you know, plenty of equity in and drained the entire emergency fund into the mortgage. So essentially, for FAFSA schools at least, appearing to make $110,000 disappear. It's not super fancy. That was what his CPA advised him to do. And at the time, that it still works. So, okay, this is awesome. This makes sense. I just wanted to clarify here. We actually had an episode, I think it was maybe episode 66, although I have to double check it, talking about your emergency fund. Where do you need to have your emergency fund? I think so many of us keep it in cash. And what's interesting about this individual, he had a massive cash pile and he was being essentially penalized for it on the FAFSA application. So in his case, plow all of that back into the home. So you have the equity, it hasn't disappeared. And then if he needs it, he has a HELOC that he can then to use, pull it out on an as needed basis. So I think that's being very risk averse and that's a very reasonable position, especially if you have a ton of equity in your home. I guess the next thing I want to do, we talked about all these different funding vehicles. I would love to kind of think about a order of priority, right? You know, and I, it kind of depends on which strategy you're taking, where you are on the income level, what sort of assets you have. But Sunwoo is you. Like if you're going to kind of build a one size fits all equation or maybe just for yourself or for kids down the road, like what would your order of priorities be? How would you go about what would be the stepwise process for yourself and your child as you're planning out college funding? First, you want to use up any non-retirement assets in your child's name, because, again, that's the one that gets weighted at 20 percent. Another point is I know that some parents will use retirement accounts to fund their children's education. I really do not advise that, but I know People are going to use them anyway in some scenarios. So if you are going to do that, don't do that until junior year, because even though the balance doesn't count against you, any withdrawal you make has to get included in income. And by waiting until junior year, because of that prior prior rule, that delay in reporting, that distribution doesn't get counted as income. Finally, if you know that you're going to spend the entire balance in the 529 by the time your kid graduates, you should use assets in your taxable accounts first. This effect isn't very big, but basically what ends up happening is the 529 shields the income generated by the assets. What I mean is, let's say you have your VTSAX in a taxable brokerage account. Every year it throws off about 2% in dividends. So that 2% in dividends gets reported as income. Whereas if you held VTSAX in the 529, that 2% in dividend, it gets added to the 529 balance, but you don't have a separate line item to report the dividend as income, which gets weighted at 47%. Yeah, that's a cool little hack. It's just thinking about this slightly differently. That's not going to be an enormous money savings, but even if it's a couple thousand bucks, just knowing the ordering rules will set you ahead. I mean, who's going to turn away a couple thousand bucks free, right? Right. And while we're on that topic, one thing, um, not to be morbid, but people with their parents, if grandma and grandpa are getting older, given the tax rates that Sun was talking about earlier, how the student's assets versus the parents' assets are counted. If generous grandma in her will, unbeknownst to you, has a bunch of the money going straight to the kid that's about to be walloped and, and held at a, a much higher rate, you know, not that you want to have those conversations because it's awkward, but it, the money will not be going to little Jimmy. It'll be going to the school instead. So from an optimization standpoint, if you're having that talk with 
parents as they get older, it's good to know. Right. So again, it's high level. 20% of the assets in the kid's name go towards EFC and only roughly 5.6% in the parent's name. So that's kind of a guiding light here as I'm hearing it. So to be cognizant of who has these assets, that's the important part. If you have the ability to put them in the parent's or the grandparent's name, then do it. And you're going to save a huge percentage that would otherwise go negatively in this EFC calculation, right? Right. So Sunwoo, I I wanted to get your opinion. Like, What's the interplay between 529 plans and scholarships? There's definitely a concern among parents that you wouldn't be able to use your 529 money if your kid gets a scholarship. Fortunately, if your kid gets a scholarship, you can withdraw the money, the amount of the scholarship from your 529 penalty free, not tax free. So you still have to pay the taxes on the gains, but you don't pay that 10% penalty. Okay. So that's an interesting nuance there because earlier you basically said that the 529 acted like a Roth. So a Roth is it goes in post-tax and then whatever gains you have are tax-free. This sounds like there is a slight nuance here with the 529. Well, it's in the context of the scholarship because if you didn't have um, a good understanding of how taxation of 529 works, um, you might think that you are essentially penalized for saving in the 529 and then getting a scholarship. Because if you got the scholarship, then now you can't use your 529 money tax-free. Yeah, that's very useful. So that actually does answer a lingering question that I've had, which is based on the information that Brian gave on his prior episode and things I've learned about college and potentially getting scholarships for my daughters, am I oversaving in the 529? But you're saying if you do get scholarships, if your kids get scholarships, they can pull that amount out penalty free from the 529. Almost the government in essence saying like, okay, we get it. You tried to save, but they got scholarships. You shouldn't be penalized. Correct. So Brian, you know, I want to come back to you and I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess what you call scholarship clawbacks. You know, all of us want to get as many scholarships as possible, right? To offset the cost of college, but do they ever work against each other? They sometimes do. A large portion of my strategy in applying to a lot of schools was I knew that different schools would have different levels of flexibility involving what different pieces of terminology are, are used. They're called either clawbacks or are these scholarships stackable is a question you can ask a college. I think it stinks in a lot of cases when schools do this because what that means is say you get awarded X dollars in merit aid or various forms of aid from the school and then you're, a kid is industrious and goes and writes an essay and wins a scholarship from the Rotary Club or for Eagle Scout or, or for whatever. There are some schools that will reduce up to or 50 percent on the 50 cents on the dollar or up to dollar per dollar just clawing that money back. So essentially you end up getting zero dollars for winning that scholarship and working hard, which is a terrible message to send kids. But you know, it's, it's their money. It's their right to claw some of it back. So asking that hard question up front is important to avoid you know, four or five or more figure surprises down the line. Uh, there are people I'm friends with whose their entire college list changed once they realized, oh, this is not OK. Uh, all these schools are just going to punish my kid for having applied to and won these these various awards. Luckily, a number of schools do not punish student industriousness and say, you know, Good on you for doing that. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. The one thing that becomes patently clear is that the early planner is rewarded. This is not something that you want to figure out your child's freshman year in college. I mean, just prior prior is kicking you back a couple years. So again, just like we did with episode 114, we have gone to painstaking efforts to include all the links that we covered in this and additional resources that both Brian and Sunwoo recommended in the show notes for today's episode. So that'll be a perpetual resource for you. In addition, obviously, if you haven't yet, go back and listen to episode 114 of the podcast where we had Brian on talking about other aspects of this financial journey. Uh, It's going to be a valuable use of your time. Huge thank you to Brian and Sunwoo for coming on the show. And while in most shows, that would be the end of the episode. Sunwoo, it is your turn to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Sure. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation. These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Sunwoo, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. Uh, I'm going to go with Doctor of Credit. It's not a financial independence blog, but it talks a lot about uh, credit cards, bank account bonuses, and just general money-saving tips. 
All right. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. I'm going to go with a classic. Mr. Money Mustache is a shockingly simple math to early retirement. Yeah, that was mine as well. That is the ultimate classic and a fan favorite. I think a significant portion of our hot seat guests have listed that. I know it changed my life. All right, Sunru, question number three, your favorite life hack. So I'm going to go with tracking my time. A lot of us in the financial community will tell us that, uh, we'll say that you need to track your your spending. Uh, You need to know where your money goes before you can actually do anything to change it. And I would say that's true as well for tracking your time. If you want to get anything done, you need to figure out where you're spending your time. Are you wasting it sitting and watching uh what what's the show that you pick on Jonathan Grey's Anatomy <laughs> I've become Anatomy, I've become a fan <laughs> <laughs> Yeah but yeah I mean when I started tracking my time I had a pretty significant increase in productivity just by realizing that I spent way too much time on Facebook and Twitter Awesome man all right uh question number 4 your biggest financial mistake I can't really think of a genuine mistake. I think the closest would probably be not actually considering the cost of college. I really did not pay much attention at all to how much college costs. In the end, it didn't cost me anything because my parents were very gracious and they paid for everything. But yeah, unlike everything that I've just talked about in this episode, I paid zero attention to financial aid or scholarships. Well, we're glad you're remedying that fact for us now. And right, to your larger point, your parents obviously paid for it. So paying attention to it, while it didn't cause you to have significant amounts of student debt, who knows what scenario you could have played out if you got a full merit scholarship somewhere and your parents didn't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in college, right? So I, right. you know, paying attention to it could have been a huge financial boon to you. All right, Sunwoo, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. I would say try to socialize more. I was definitely too buried in my books in college. I mean, in the end, it let me graduate a year early. So is it really a mistake? I don't know. But yeah, I could have uh, relaxed a bit more in college. All right, Sunwoo, we do have a bonus question for you. What purchase have you made over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? I want to say my robotic vacuum. I am quite lazy when it comes to cleaning my apartment. So if I can just have it be automatically cleaned, that's a huge win for me. Have you written a script for it? Oh, uh, no. Thankfully, <laughs> other people have done that for me. But. <laughs> All right, cool. So, guys, thank you so much for coming on the show today to our audience. Uh, Brian, you can connect with at edisonprep.com, local tutoring service for SATs in Atlanta, a wonderful resource that fortunately for you, if you're there, is not scalable. You get a very personalized service, highly recommended. Sunwoo, what is the best way for people to connect with you and connect with your content if they want to find out more, both about 529s and other investment vehicles? So you can find my blog at blog.sunwoolie.com. And actually at the top of the page there, you can find a link to all my posts on college. Brian Sunwoo, thanks for coming on the show, fellas. Thanks for having me. Yep, Happy to record with you guys. All right, to our audience, you know, knowing the rules, that's what it really comes down to. And that's what we keep trying to do. This is not our comfort zone. This is not our personal body of knowledge, which is why it's so critical to have people like Brian and Sun Wu that are willing to come share their knowledge base with us and with our community. If you got value from today's episode, and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just let the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. And if you want to support us in what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.